On July 7, 2021, Chandler Halderson entered the Dane County Sheriff's Northeast Precinct and reported his parents missing. He told Deputy Joshua Seeley that Bard and Krista Halderson had left their home on Oak Spring Circle in Windsor, Wisconsin on Friday, July 2nd and went to their cabin in White Lake, about 160 miles or 260 kilometers north. Chandler told the deputy that his parents had gone to the cabin with some friends, but he didn't know exactly who those friends were. He explained that Bart and Krista were planning to spend the weekend fixing a couple of things that had been damaged in a recent storm. Chandler said that they were supposed to be home Sunday evening or possibly Monday, but never returned. It being Wednesday with no sign of the couple, Chandler thought it was time to file a missing persons report. Chandler told Deputy Seeley that he had tried to call his parents, but their cell phones went straight to voicemail. The deputy tried the numbers, but got the same response. At that time, Deputy Seeley and Deputy John Nelson went to the home on Oak Spring Circle to investigate the disappearance. Once they arrived and found no sign of the Haldersons, homicide detectives were called to the scene. Detectives Sabrina Sims and Brian Schunk arrived at the home where they noticed there were sections of flooring missing and there was other construction work being done in the home. They questioned Chandler and he told them that he was a college student and that he worked in IT. He told them that he had helped pack his parents' supplies and they left early Friday morning. He said that they had been picked up by friends but that he didn't know who those friends were. He told them that he received a text from his mother on Sunday saying they would be home Monday or Tuesday. What the detectives didn't know but would soon find out was that nothing Chandler told them was true. This is Monsters. The Haldersons were an average American family living in Windsor, about 30 minutes north of Madison, Wisconsin. Bard and Krista Halderson were married on July 30, 1994. Bart was a certified public accountant for BDO USA, and Krista was an administrative assistant for Zimbrick Automotive. They had two sons, 24-year-old Mitchell and 23-year-old Chandler. The older of the two, Mitchell, had graduated from the University of Wisconsin, was working for a software development company, was living on his own, and was engaged. Chandler was still living at home with his parents, but he was about to graduate from Madison College, formerly Madison Area Technical College, with a certificate in renewable resource engineering. He had a good job working for American Family Insurance in the IT department, but he had been recently hired by SpaceX. He and his girlfriend, Catherine Melender, who goes by Cat, were planning to move to Florida once he graduated as that was where SpaceX operated. The Halderson family as a whole was a seemingly normal family living their lives. Chandler and Mitchell were typical brothers. Living apart during the COVID lockdown, they spent time playing video games online and both had medical issues in the months leading up to Bart and Krista's disappearance. Mitchell went to the doctor for a regular checkup and was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. He was actually hospitalized for a short time. Chandler had fallen down the stairs in his home a few weeks prior to Bart and Krista's disappearance and he hit both the front and back of his head. He suffered a concussion and a hemorrhage. He claimed to have headaches, vision problems, and nerve damage that affected his legs and his ability to walk. When Bard and Krista went missing in July, Chandler first texted Mitchell to let him know that their parents had gone to their cabin up north for the weekend, but they hadn't returned. This was the first that Mitchell had heard about the trip, and with Krista being a bit of a helicopter parent in Mitchell's own words, he thought it was strange that she hadn't told him about the trip. 
He would later say on the stand that his mother always told him when they were planning to go to the cabin, but she hadn't this time. When Mitchell questioned his brother about the trip, Chandler told him that Bart and Krista left Friday morning and went with unknown friends in an unknown vehicle. This also struck Mitchell as unusual as his parents were known to drive themselves most frequently. Chandler went to the sheriff's precinct in Windsor at 11.25 on the morning of July 7th, the Wednesday after they were supposed to return. Here, he told deputies that his parents were supposed to be back Sunday night or Monday morning, but later he told them that he received a text from his mother on Sunday stating they would be back either Monday night or Tuesday morning. Deputies went to the Halderson home and looked around. They made an effort to reach Bart and Krista by phone, but the calls just went straight to voicemail. At that point, the sheriffs called in Detective Shunk and Sims to come out to the house and begin a missing persons investigation. On the evening of July 7th, Detective Shunk interviewed Chandler to get more in-depth details into what the situation was. Chandler told him pretty much the same thing he had told the deputies. With a little more detail, that story was that he helped his parents get ready for the trip on Thursday, packing up tools and supplies. He said that they must have left early Friday morning because he had awoke at 6.15 a.m. and they were already gone. He said that he didn't know who they went with or who drove, but both of their cars were still in the garage. He explained that he had received no calls from either of them, but that he had texted his mother a few times after they left. Most of the texts were through iMessage, the system used when you're texting between Apple products, but the text he sent on Saturday at 4.47 p.m. went through as a regular text message. That can happen when the receiving phone is turned off. That text said, quote, Hoping this goes through, I bet there's a lot of people up there making it hard to message. It seems like he's suggesting that having a lot of people in the area, likely for the 4th of July weekend, is clogging up the cellular system, making it hard to send messages. A convenient reason why he hadn't heard from his parents that weekend. Krista had texted him back Sunday at 11.04 a.m. and that text read, quote, Made it safely, can't get anything through, and yes, it's packed. Going to White Lake today for the parade and will be home Monday night slash Tuesday early. Love you lots. This seemed perfectly fine with Chandler at the time, but what's weird is that Krista hadn't seemed to make any arrangements with her employer to not be at work. Not only for the extra day, as it seemed like she was going to come back a day later than originally planned, but she hadn't made any arrangements to be off of work at all. Her co-worker, Daniel Croninger, said that he was surprised when she never showed up for work Friday morning. When interviewed later, he said it was extremely unusual for Krista to not show up for work, especially not even calling. Daniel wasn't just Krista's co-worker, but he was a friend of the family, so he invited Chandler over to his house on Sunday to watch fireworks, and while there, Chandler told him that he had talked to his parents and that they would be back Monday. When Krista still didn't show up for work Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, he pushed for Chandler to file a missing persons report. So it turns out that Chandler did not go to the sheriff's precinct out of his own concern. No, Daniel had to push him to do it. On the day that Chandler reported his parents missing, he texted his mother over an hour and a half after he arrived at the sheriff's precinct, saying, quote, Hey, I'm worried. At the police station, can you text or call? Again, that was sent as a standard message, meaning Krista's phone was likely off. Chandler showed detectives around the house. In a lower level of the house, there were a couple of couches pushed together into what Chandler called a fort, which seemed to be where Chandler had been sleeping. It seemed as though there were some renovations happening at the house and the upstairs bathroom, closest to Chandler's bedroom, was not in working order. Chandler was sleeping on the lower level where there was a bathroom right nearby. The reason for that was because his recent head injury made it hard for him to get around in the dark and this setup made it easier for him to get to the bathroom at night. In the same room with the couches, there was also a fireplace that was missing a pane of glass. Chandler would explain that this happened while he was throwing a ball for one of his dogs. 
He cut his foot on glass and got blood on the floor. Another item that the detectives noticed was a note that had been left by Krista. It said, quote, Good morning, Chandler. Hope your day goes really well. Then it had a phone number of a neighbor and said, quote, Pam, just in case. Chandler explained that his mother had left the phone number just in case he experienced any issues related to his head injury while they were away. After that, the detectives began interviewing friends and neighbors to find any other information about the missing couple. Everyone interviewed said the situation was very unusual. The Haldersons leaving for unknown reasons, them supposedly taking many bottles of alcohol, Krista not calling or showing up for work, and the fact that she had no communication with her sons. One friend echoed Mitchell's sentiment about his mother and claimed she was a very doting mother who was very involved in her son's lives. She was known to be in communication with them multiple times a day. Her going days with no contact was very unusual. Detectives also spoke with Pam, who said she knew about Chandler's head injury and that Krista had asked her if she would be home the previous Wednesday. She was going to be at work, and Bart had a dentist appointment, so she wanted to leave her number with Chandler just in case he had any issues. Pam told the detectives that she hadn't heard anything from Krista about leaving her number for Chandler over the 4th of July weekend. It seemed as though Chandler may have taken an old note and put it on the table, passing it off as being written that weekend. By this time, Mitchell and his fiance began driving to White Lake to look around at the cabin. Mitchell had called and texted his parents, but got no response. Eventually, sheriff's deputies from Langlade County met Mitchell at the cabin to investigate. They first took a walk around the property. Do you guys have a boat or anything up here? Yeah, that's what I wanted to try to get in there as well to see if any of them anything. Boathouse, okay. Yeah, that's the boathouse there. I mean, everything was still pretty closed up like this. Can you tell if the latches are on from that window? The sheriff's deputies forced entry into the cabin and checked for occupants. Sheriff's office, anybody inside? Melt your presence, make yourselves known. Bart and Krista were not at the cabin, and it didn't look like anyone had been there for some time. The property was overgrown, and the cabin didn't show any signs that anyone had been inside. They looked in a shed on the property and in a boathouse, but didn't find anything. 
there was no sign of any disturbance either, so it seemed like they had never even gotten to the cabin if they were intending to go there, which contradicted the text that Chandler had gotten from his mother on Sunday. While in the area, deputies found a flyer that advertised a parade happening in White Lake which was scheduled for Saturday, July 3rd at 2 p.m., this also contradicted the text that Chandler had gotten from his mother claiming to be going to the parade on Sunday. While Mitchell was at the cabin, Chandler was going around his neighborhood asking if anyone had seen or heard anything regarding his parents. He can be seen on a ring doorbell camera at one house, and he can be heard asking a different neighbor if his camera might have picked up anything Friday morning. Would you have any notifications from... Friday morning, early, before 6.15? Um, we can check. That's not a problem. Is that uh, before 6.15? Yeah, before 6.15, kind of since Thursday midnight. Any, okay. Any notifications? Okay. I, my wife is the one that knows how to run that, so um, I'll have her pull it up on the computer. Um, so Thursday, Thursday night to Friday morning. Yeah. Okay. The neighbor turned over footage from their security camera to authorities and it showed that nobody left the home before 6.15 a.m. on July 2nd. Bard and Krista didn't get picked up by anybody, they didn't walk out of the house, they didn't leave in any way. On the evening of Friday, July 8th, Detective Shunk brought Chandler into the station to have a formal interview. He immediately started acting weird when he was left alone in the interview room. He got up and put his head against the wall like he was trying to listen to what was happening in another room. It's unclear if he knows he's being recorded yet, but this isn't the only thing he does to make it seem like he's trying to find out what authorities know. By the way, a detective at my house said something's happened, and while we were leaving, people were going inside. Is there a warrant for my house? Should there be? No, I'm just wondering if... Okay. Can they go um, in? As far as I know, they were at your house and they were going to be there talking to you to ask if you would come up here and talk yeah, to us. Yeah, but um, Officer Haley just like walked pretty much in to the gate, you know, the gate on the outside. Mm -hmm. She just kind of walked in. I was, I was wondering. If was that warm. when you were getting your wallet? Uh, no, we were, we were, um, I was in the car waiting to leave. I was just wondering. Everything's okay, because okay. she said something's happened, Okay, and we need to go down. All right, I'll find out what that's about. He clearly wanted to get more information about the investigation, but the detective doesn't offer any. At that point, Detective Shunk asked Chandler to go through exactly what he did, starting from the Wednesday before they supposedly left to go to the cabin. Wednesday, June 30th, was the day that Chandler said the glass on the fireplace was broken and he injured himself. You said you were injured. What type of injury? I got a pretty deep hole in my foot. Uh, last night, Mary looked at it and she said the reason it keeps bleeding is because there's glass in it. Oh, so, that's the... You showed us your toe. Yeah, I showed the okay. detective leaf. The yeah, leaf yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... That one. It could be infected is what she's thinking, but Neosporin's been helping. Okay, good. Um, Keeping it clean and stuff? The best it, you can. Best. I, I know how, I guess. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, once I, oh, Wednesday, back to Wednesday. Yeah. Once I got all the glass out of the dog's hair, um, she didn't sustain any injuries. Good. Uh, nothing even on her nose. She got it with her 
shoulder bone, I believe. Chandler explained that his father had been working from home, which was understandable since this was the middle of 2001, and they had eaten lunch and watched Wheel of Fortune before the glass broke, which set his dad off. When did you clean up at all when it actually happened? No, my dad was furious. So, you just uh, so he, he did stuff. To clean it? Yeah, I don't know what he did. But I, he sent me to my room upstairs, and he did whatever he did, but it still was on the floor after he was done. Okay. While researching this case, I've gotten a strange feeling about the relationship between Chandler and his parents. In the last clip, he says his father was furious over the broken glass and sent him to his room. Chandler's 23 years old at this time. I feel like Bart could have just had Chandler clean it up, but sent him to his room? Chandler's girlfriend, Kat, tells investigators in a later interview that he was grounded in the days leading up to their disappearance. This was not the first thing that Chandler said in his interview that made me feel like the family dynamic was a little off. I kind of shit the day away. I play video games. Okay. Parents are gone, why not, right? Yeah. I didn't do anything that I should have. I should have been cleaning and all that. Well, the house seemed pretty clean when I was there. You see all the dog hair? That, uh, that's got to be gone. It all comes along it. with it, right? Yeah. The detective said the house seemed pretty clean, but while his parents were gone, Chandler said he should have been cleaning. All of the dog hair had to be gone. Now, there's nothing wrong with giving your kids chores and expecting them to pull their own weight, but it seems like there's a rigidity with Chandler's parents that he might have gotten tired of. In evidence photos of their basement, everything is organized and labeled, and it feels like Chandler's not the type of person who likes to put in a lot of work, something that will be supported by a later discovery. It was Thursday evening over dinner that Bruce and Krista told Chandler that they were going to the cabin. Then we just kind of hung out, and my mom gets home, and I uh, start the, I start uh, shrimp scampi for my dad, because that's what he wanted, but we didn't have shrimp, so I, I made shrimpless scampi. Um, uh, that's, that's where they told me while we were eating it, they, they were going to go with their friends, and I was like, oh, cool. Um, well, and they I said they were going cabin. Yeah. Well, okay. we were going up north. Up That's north how they right. referred to it. Who said that? Mom or dad? Ma. My, my dad doesn't talk well. He eats. Okay. Um, so there we are at Thursday dinner. Up north of the cabin, my dad says, I'll need a set for pipe repair and gas. So I'm like, all right. I grabbed the pipe repair stuff from his um, plumbing chest, or plumbing plumbing box. It's like a, a tote of what you'd need for pipe repair. Mm -hmm. um, and two whatever jerry cans, I, I can't remember the amount, but they're red with the safety nozzles. Got those squared away. They had most of their duffels already packed at that point. Mm -hmm. And we all just started bringing them down to the mudroom with the shoes yeah. by the garage. Where you shot me in. After they got the supplies ready for the trip, the three of them watched a movie together and then Bruce and Krista went to bed while Chandler stayed up until after midnight playing video games. He said then he went downstairs and went to sleep on the couches that were set up into a fort. Friday morning, I woke up. They had left with the stuff was all set out. Uh, they remembered the gas. Um, I found the, the, the folding chairs that they wanted to bring, but they never brought them. I assume they could fit them. They're big. So I put those away. Um, that was Friday morning. I go upstairs, do the dog, or feed the dogs. It was around six-ish, 
and that's six fifteen when I woke up. I was a little late that day. Six fifteen Friday, okay. Uh, that's just when I looked at my phone. Mm-hmm. Dogs saw my Ma's note, the insurance for my appointment. I just ate whatever's on the counter. I think it was cornbread. Where was the note from your mom? That was on the, the kitchen, like there's a peninsula. Yeah. With the insurance stacked up. But I, I moved it to the table. Okay. And then those insurance cards were there also that we saw yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think she knew which one I would need. According to Chandler, when he got up at 6.15 Friday morning, his parents were already gone. He saw the note that his mother had left along with some insurance cards because Chandler had a doctor's appointment and would need the insurance information. Now, at this point, investigators know that nobody came to the house and picked up Bart and Krista. They know that the Haldersons never left the house Friday morning. They also know that the note that was left for Chandler was actually left for him the previous Wednesday. Chandler explained that over the weekend, he split his time between playing video games and hanging out with his girlfriend, Kat. Of course, at the same time, Kat was in a different interview room going over everything they did that weekend. She believed that Chandler was innocent, and she was just giving them a rundown of their whereabouts in order to eliminate them as suspects. She's a fan of true crime, and she knew that the people closest to a victim are always the most common suspects, and she believed she was helping eliminate both herself and Chandler so they could move on to find the real suspect. In reality, they were comparing everything that she was telling them to what Chandler was telling Detective Shunk. A lot of their information matched, but there were a couple of discrepancies. The first thing that Chandler said that isn't entirely accurate is about visiting a farm that's owned by Kat's mother's girlfriend. Her name is Crescent Lasai, and she goes by Cress. Chandler and Kat went to the farm on Sunday, July 4th and had dinner, but then Chandler returned by himself the next day. Both Kat's mother, Dulcie, and Cress said that Chandler had never been to the farm on his own before. They only knew him through Kat, so it was reasonable that he had always been there with her the handful of times he had been there previously. For the afternoon, I did go to the farm to talk to Cress and Kat's mom. I told them what's happening with my health because I had the appointment at 2. Did you go to the farm before or after? After, because I told them what happened to me. And I told them... The legs are probably going to be permanent, and the headaches should be fixed after the hemorrhage is cleared a little bit. So, now that I'm there, I talked to their mom, um, and Cress together, and I think Kat's mom is all right with me. She's, I don't know, she wants me to move into her, the east side cat's house okay. and start paying rent as an apartment because she doesn't like that I live at home. Does cat live with their mom or? Cat has an apartment. Okay. Somewhere. Cat does? Yeah, it's on, it's by Mifflin. Okay. The party avenue, it's by there. Um, Okay. So, I'm there talking to their mom and Chris. Then I, um, then I go up to have, you know, a breakdown by their shed and they go swimming. Um, right by the swimming pool is the shed, so they're, they wanted to watch me, like, you know, break down and all that so after I noticed they're just watching I just walk over to him. Chandler tends to mumble and ramble so in a nutshell he explained that he went back to the farm on Monday. He talked to Dulcie and Cress about his injury and how the problem with his legs will probably be permanent. 
according to Kress. He also told them that he wouldn't be able to fly to Florida to begin training for SpaceX, so he was going to lose that job. He explained that, after an emotional breakdown, he then used their pool, something he had asked about the day before. When he and Kat had been to the farm for dinner on Sunday, he asked Cress if he could use her pool from time to time because he thought it would be good exercise for his legs. She said yes, but said she was surprised to see him back the next day on his own. The problem was that, when Cress had been questioned earlier, she told investigators that Chandler disappeared for a while before getting into the pool. According to Cress, after Chandler said he was going to use the pool, she waited for a while and then decided she was going to get in the pool herself. When she got out there, the cover was still on the pool and Chandler wasn't there. When she looked around, she saw Chandler's car, a blue Subaru Outback that was actually his father's. She said it was backed up to a wooded area and the back hatch was open. Her and Dulcie got into the pool, and a little while later, they saw Chandler come out of the woods and walk over to the pool. He said he had gone for a walk, and when he got in the pool, he kind of washed off his body, claiming he was itchy from the walk. Of course, this piqued the interest of investigators, and they asked Cress for permission to search her property. This search began at the same time Chandler was taken to the station for the interview that was recorded. Their reason was that they wanted to know why he hadn't told them about this second trip to the farm. While Chandler was giving Detective Shunk a rundown of his whereabouts, the farm was being searched. When a detective went out to the farm to conduct a search, he noticed some vultures circling over the wooded area where Chandler had been seen by Cress and Dulcie. When he investigated that area, he found a pile of dead branches and could tell there was something underneath them. When he took a closer look, he realized it was a human torso. It was the body of an adult male. The head, arms, and legs had been removed. There was no shirt, but there was a pair of gray cargo shorts and a black belt. There was also a rope tied around the waist. There were two gunshot wounds on the torso. In the woods, there was also a garbage can, and inside the can was a gray tarp with blood on it. They found a target bag with bloody rags in it near where the remains were. There was a label on the bag with Kat's name on it. Near where the Subaru had been parked, there was an old rusty metal drum that had a hole cut in it. Inside, investigators found a few saw blades and a pair of scissors. Even though they needed to confirm the identity of the recovered remains, it was assumed that the torso belonged to Bart Halderson. Investigators were also searching the Halderson home, and they had found evidence of blood on the floor of the basement, along with a bullet fragment and a spent shell casing. Inside the fireplace, the same one with the broken glass, they found multiple bone fragments. They found both Bart and Krista's driver's licenses and cell phones wrapped in tin foil and paper towels, stuffed inside a shoe and hidden under a shelf in the garage. Detective Shunk was notified about these discoveries while still in the interview with Chandler. Is there any reason to believe mom or dad's blood would be somewhere in the house? Have they been injured at all that you're aware of? Oh, my dad scratches his psoriasis till he, like, gushes blood. Okay. Gushing. Um, Describe gushing to me. Enough to run down your leg, like, um, like, cover your leg, I suppose, like, he has it on his knee. So when he does this, it just, like, drips oh, nice. down. Uh, I ask him to stop, but he doesn't do it when he's stressed out. Yeah. He, he just kind of, like, it's his tick. He's just, yeah, probably itches. Does he, um, like, does it enough to get on the floor? Does it leave? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, how much, like, before we were talking the water bottle lid and the Yeti lid, is there, I mean, like, are we talking puddles like that, or just... Oh. Or... It could be enough. Okay. But I'm thinking Yeti lit if he's there and I don't catch him soon enough. Oh, jeez. My ma's blood? Um, just from her bloody noses she gets sometimes when she wakes up. Uh, that's why we've been doing uh, the dehumidifier, or humidifier and dehumidifiers. Yeah. Probably downstairs you get the... We, ha we have to do multiple of them, but she can't be in the living room too long because that's a dehumidifier. 
Yeah. And if she does, she, her nose gets bad. Not like a regular one. She gets it bad. Um, but she either goes to the kitchen to fix it, her vanity, or the bathroom. Um, when she has bloody noses, are we talking? It's just spraying around? Is it just dripping? Well, it's not it's squirting, but it's just dripping, and she doesn't notice it. Okay. Because she can't feel it anymore. Okay. Of course, anybody is going to have their own blood in their home. You cut yourself shaving or chopping vegetables or get a bloody nose. But those things don't usually leave evidence of puddles of blood. Chandler claimed that his father scratched himself so much that he left puddles of blood on the floor the size of the lid to the cup he's drinking water out of, which is a good 4 inches or 10 centimeters in diameter. That's a decent pool of blood to come from scratching yourself. Of course, he claimed his mother got nosebleeds, but again, those leave drips, not pools of blood. Then there's his claim that he cut his toe on glass, and that also left blood all over the floor. But the detective said the wound was tiny and didn't look very new. Eventually, Detective Shunk laid his cards out on the table. So we have like 20 pages of writing. We're going to start with a clean, white piece of paper for you to start telling the truth. Okay. What? Because listen, listen to me. This is the only chance you're going to have to tell us the truth. Okay. Okay. What we, listen, listen. I'm, I can't tell you what we know, but we know you're not telling us the truth. We know your parents are no longer with us, okay? And we know the reason why, okay? You need to tell the truth. There's... Listen, <sighs> listen. You need to tell the truth about what happened and just tell us why it happened, okay? If something happened, if you were defending yourself or if you just no, got I... fed up with stuff, you need to tell us the truth, okay? This is your chance to tell us why, okay? I'm not BSing you, Okay? So can we do that? Okay, they're okay. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Lawyer. I'm sorry. Say it again, Jim. Lawyer. Okay. Because they're... Okay. You want a lawyer? Yeah. They're okay. 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 They're okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's right. It's on the time there. It's about 641. You're under arrest. Okay. The gears are turning. Chandler's trying to figure out a way to spin things, but in my opinion, he just doesn't have it in him. It's a combination of lack of smarts and lack of motivation. First, he killed his parents at home and dumped their remains in places that were easily connected to him. Then he made up a story that was so out of character for his parents that it sent red flags up for every single person that knew them. On top of that, he showed no interest in the interview. He seems like he's put out doing anything other than shrugging his shoulders. Okay. What happened? Okay. Can You know what happened. We're not going to tell you what happened. You know what happened. You were there when it happened. We're not BSing you, okay? I wasn't there when it happened. Can I... We know more I, than you think we know. I understand. There's people that have told us things. We have we have evidence. We have proof that more has happened. Okay. So your parents never made it to the cabin, and I think you know that. Okay. So you're asking for an attorney. We're not going to ask any more questions. Miss him. Just stand up. You want to stand up and just come right over here for me? Do you have anything in your pockets at all? Wallet. Just a wallet to just put in there. For us. His demeanor is strange to me. In my opinion, he doesn't seem upset that he's being accused of something he didn't do. He seems frustrated that they aren't believing his story. From the moment they told him they knew he did it, he doesn't show any surprise. He doesn't really deny anything. He tries to claim he wasn't there when it happened, but he barely gets that out and kind of gives up. It's like he knows they're right, he just can't understand how his brilliant plan didn't work. It seems like there's a misconception that you can report someone missing and the authorities will take a report and then those people will just remain missing. 
Of course, there are times when the police shrug off a missing person, but you have to at least expect they might investigate. This isn't the first case where it seems like someone wanted to report a person missing and thought the murder would just go away after that. Like the murder of Ashley Zhao, which I covered in Season 1. Her father reported her missing and then was surprised when police began immediately searching for her. I think Chandler's plan was to report his parents missing and then they would just never be found. Having authorities immediately investigate, find evidence of foul play and connect it to him is more than he can process. The discovery of the torso at the farm and the other evidence at the house is only the beginning of what would prove that Chandler killed his parents. At that point though, they only had the torso and they confirmed that it was in fact Bart. They now needed to find out what had happened to Krista, hoping that she might still be alive. Kat having been so cooperative, she let investigators download the data from her cell phone. As they went through the data, they came across some information that gave them a lead as to where Krista might have been. It turned out that Chandler had been unfaithful to Kat in the past. Surprise, surprise. So she had begun using Snapchat to track his location. Friday evening, Chandler had told Kat that he needed to stay home and do some cleaning the following morning. But when she opened her Snapchat app, she saw his location marked in her app with the label Hubby, and he was nowhere near his house. No, at almost 9 o'clock on Saturday morning, Chandler was 25 miles away from his house in an area near the Wisconsin River. She took a screenshot of it and investigators later used the information to conduct a search. That was where they found two legs cut into multiple sections. DNA testing confirmed that they belonged to Krista. Along with that, tests of the blood on the cutting tools found on the farm turned out to be Bard and Krista's as well. Chandler Halderson was charged with the first-degree murder of his parents as well as other charges for lying to the police and mutilating a corpse. While the district attorney prepared for the trial, the reason behind the murder began becoming clear. It turned out that Chandler had not been attending college, he had not been working for American Family Insurance, and he had not received a job offer from SpaceX. Investigators found a surveillance video of Chandler buying the tarp that was found on the farm near Bart's remains. They found emails to Chandler from people at his college and at American Family Insurance, but it turned out that the emails were fake. Chandler had made the email accounts and used them to create correspondence he could show his parents that would help support his lies. But Bart was getting impatient. The day before being murdered, Bart had realized that Chandler wasn't actually about to graduate from college. Hi, um, I'm trying to get an appointment scheduled to meet with somebody um, to mainly just get a copy of the transcript and also a printed copy of a certificate that was earned and, and uh, you know, other degree verification. Okay. How, how, do, how do we get that done? Okay, for the degree, you have to download the duplicate uh, diploma form and send it in with a, with a check or a money order of $4 for the diploma to be mailed back to you. For the transcript, you have to go online and request it. Yeah, I tried requesting on online and we never got them. And I've spent on how many times doing that and at eight bucks a piece, so I'm not willing to do that again. What, 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 why is that letting you request your transcript? What is it? It's not my system, it's your system, so don't ask me questions like that. Okay, but I need to establish the problem first before I can know how to like walk you through to get it. Are you by a computer? So I can walk no. you through on how to get it? I've gone through the process before I worked with um you know, I had I tried to work with Daniel Spike to see if he can get through the information. I don't believe, I don't know if he's with you guys anymore, but it just seems like the ball keeps getting dropped. Bart seems to be fairly abrasive during this call, but it's because he believes the school is screwing up and he's trying to get transcripts that, as far as he knows, there shouldn't be any problem with. 
When Chandler's account is pulled up, it shows that he owes the school $2,349. So there's a hold on his transcripts. Bart says he's going to come into the school to pay the fee and get the transcripts, but then he asks about Chandler's certificate. Now, if you've earned a certificate, say, in that solar program, you said, where does that get requested to? If you earned a certificate? Yeah. I don't I don't see that you earned a certificate. Uh, there, were, there were no, like... You, you were taking... I, I, oh, okay. You were taking IT classes, right? I don't see that you were in a program. But prior to the IT, there was a solar program, too. Yeah, but I don't see that you, you were Chandler Emerson. No, there was an old account I got change to this new one so would it be under the old account that didn't get or did all that get transferred over can you tell if those two were combined or not hold on and see no i don't see a request for duplicate uh account there was no how way. far back does that account go that you're looking at like when was the first class taken 18 spring of 2018. oh okay so that does have all the history then Said, I don't see that you were admitted in any program. You said they were, you know, it's the IT degrees in there, right? No, those, those are just classes. Like you took general education classes and, and then the IT classes. Uh, you might have just took the classes but not be in the program. During this call, it seems that Bart came to the realization that something was going on with Chandler's schooling and he planned on going to the college with Chandler the following day. That was when Chandler's house of cards finally began falling down. It's believed that, on Thursday, Chandler shot both of his parents and dismembered their bodies. Bart had a meeting scheduled at the college for 2.30 p.m., and at 2.10 p.m., he texted Chandler a message that said, quote, I'm ready whenever you are. It seemed as though Bart and Chandler were supposed to go to that meeting, but they never showed up. The spent shell casing and the bullet fragment in the basement meant that Bart was most likely shot and killed down there. The blood on the bullet fragment matched Bart's DNA. After killing his father, he sent his mother a text message asking her to pick up soda on her way home from work. This was most likely in an effort to give himself more time. Either way, once she got home, he killed her as well. Her blood was also found in the basement. That same night, Chandler went to the Quick Trip convenience store near his house and purchased 20 pounds of ice. Authorities believe that he stored the remains in a chest freezer in the basement while he worked on disposing of them. Blood was found in the drain to the freezer. Chandler used an axe and power tools to dismember his parents' bodies. An axe was found in the garage and there was blood visibly on the handle and the head. That blood came back a match for both Bart and Krista. There was also both victims' blood on Chandler's shoes, the same shoes he can be seen wearing on the surveillance footage of him purchasing the tarp that was found near Bart's torso. It seems that he burnt some of the remains in the fireplace, but might have realized that it would take too long. 230 human bone fragments were found in the fireplace, and eventually a neighbor testified that on July 1st, he could smell that someone was burning something, and he claimed that it smelled to him like pork. Yeah, seriously. Another neighbor's security camera showed a flickering light inside the Halderson home consistent with a fire. But at about 3 a.m., the light got really bright and then suddenly went out. When fat renders, it becomes flammable and it seems as though Chandler hadn't anticipated that. Burn marks around the fireplace support the theory that a fire got out of hand while he was trying to burn his parents' remains. This heat is likely what actually caused the glass on the fireplace to break. At 7 a.m. Friday morning, Chandler drove to Fleet Farm and purchased the tarp that was found on the farm with Bart's torso. Seems like an odd purchase for a 23-year-old to make first thing in the morning, but it's important to note that a matching tarp was not found anywhere in the house. 
the defense could argue that the tarp Chandler purchased wasn't the same tarp found on the farm. But then what happened to the tarp Chandler purchased? Well, it turns out that there was a fingerprint found on the tarp from the farm, and guess whose fingerprint it was? Chandler's. Later that morning, he texted Kat and asked her to bring cleaning supplies including hydrogen peroxide and he wanted her to bring ice. He had just purchased 20 pounds of ice. He needed more ice already? The defense claimed that the Haldersons just really liked cold beverages and the ice maker on their refrigerator was broken. I like really cold beverages, but I've never used anywhere near 20 pounds of ice in a day. That evening, Krista's co-worker Daniel stopped by to check on Krista since she hadn't shown up for work that day and wasn't answering his calls. Chandler told Daniel that his parents had left that morning to go to their cabin, except cell data showed that neither of Krista or Bart's cell phones ever pinged outside of the area of their home. And of course, investigators would later find their phones hidden inside the house. Chandler then decided to dump some of the remains in various places. The first place he went was to the Wisconsin River, to a place he had been the year before and dumped some of Krista's remains. There are pictures of him at the same spot a year prior. His cell records show that he went to some other areas along the Wisconsin River and authorities searched those areas but didn't find any other remains. On Sunday, Chandler claimed to have gotten a text message from his mother, but investigators know that her phone was in the house. When the text was sent, it was still pinging off the cell tower by their home. Another thing that cell records showed was that, on Monday the 5th, Chandler was supposed to have a doctor's appointment to follow up about his head injury. A little after 2 p.m., he started texting Kat about what was going on at the appointment. He told her he signed in, then texted her about getting x-rays and then a CT scan. The problem was that Chandler's phone was pinging off the cell tower by his house the whole time. Chandler didn't leave his house until 4.30pm when he went to the farm to dump his father's torso. After he reported his parents missing, he made some very interesting Google searches. At 9.44am on July 8th, he began searching the terms, quote, body found in Wisconsin, quote, Wisconsin dismembered body found, and quote, body found Milwaukee River 2021. Bart's torso wouldn't be found until later that day, and Krista's remains weren't found until the 14th. How did he know that body parts would be found by the river? Another subject that Chandler had searched was a case of a different person who had chopped up a body and threw it in a river. Months later, Cress was cleaning out a shed on her property when she found a semi-automatic rifle that she'd never seen before. She initially thought that her elderly father may have purchased it, but then she realized it might have been Chandler's and notified the police. It turned out to indeed belong to Chandler and was the weapon used to kill his parents. By the time the trial began in January of 2022, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that Chandler had killed his parents. The prosecution had a strong case to say the least, but the defense told the jury that, yes, Bart and Krista Halderson had been killed. Their remains had been found at two places that Chandler had just been as well as in the house, but that didn't mean he committed first-degree homicide. The defense told the jury that they would just have to accept that they would never know how Bart and Krista were killed. Now, the defense wasn't pushing the idea that Chandler didn't kill his parents. They wouldn't really say that he did or didn't. What they argued was that the state had not proven first-degree intentional homicide. They told the jury that there were too many questions as to how and when Bart and Krista were killed in order to say for sure that Chandler had planned to kill them. The defense would go as far as to imply that Chandler may have just found his parents and then disposed of the bodies, or that maybe it was just a horrible accident. Bart was shot in the back. What scenario would have Chandler accidentally shooting his father in the back, at least twice, and then also killing his mother? It makes no sense. On January 20th, 2022, the jury found Chandler Halderson guilty on all counts. 
In March, at his sentencing hearing, Chandler finally spoke in court for the first time. He took this opportunity to say, quote, Your Honor, I want to take this opportunity to state my intent to appeal my convictions. If there are any lawyers listening and willing to take on my appeal, take a moment to please reach out to me. It's not that I do not have feelings. It's that I was warned to not show them due to the scrutiny of this case. Thank you. So, at his own sentencing for murdering and dismembering his parents, all he wanted to say was to ask for a lawyer to help him appeal his convictions. Classy. The judge sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He sentenced him to other various terms for the other crimes to be served concurrently. But that doesn't matter because Chandler Halderson will never be released from prison. The judge made a point to say that he might have sentenced him differently if he had stopped what he was doing and was honest with authorities. But his actions, continuing to try and cover up the crime, showed his true colors. Chandler hired a new lawyer and is appealing his conviction, though the chances of him succeeding are very slim. Chandler Halderson is a monster, and the world knows it. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.